together and Seymour would often sit behind that pulpit with his head tucked inside the top crate. The testimonies, they came to an end and a reverent silence fell across the room. It lasted for several minutes. Seymour quietly removed his head from the crate and he called for those in attendance to sing in the spirit. A black middle-aged woman began to sing. The room was filled with the sound of tongues as more and more joined along. The sound of heaven began to enter into the room, all in a harmony with one another. The sound was out of this world. No one sang the same words, yet the song itself seemed as if it was directed from heaven. The whole mission came alive with the manifest presence of the Lord. Thomas perked up. He knew that when the saints all sang together, that the power of God would manifest. He pulled himself up to his tiptoes, leaned forward from his bench, his eyes fixed solely on Seymour. And then he began to look across the room. The atmosphere was heaven on earth. That's when he noticed the cloud throughout the room. The whole place was filled with smoke. A visible, physical cloud. This wasn't the first time that Thomas had seen it. The saints called it the Shekinah glory. Many claimed to see it every time they came into the mission. It never left. Sometimes it was merely a mist. Other times, it would be so thick that you could lay down in it. It was during these times when the glory was so noticeably present that the greater signs and wonders would take place. Tonight, as Thomas watched the cloud, he knew this was going to be one of those nights. The sound of singing began to lull, and Seymour moved to the opposite side of the room. There, a section of people suffering from all kinds of physical problems were seated. He raised his arms toward them and boldly said, you want to see a miracle over there? Every one of you in a few minutes is going to be up and walking in the name of Jesus. It didn't take minutes. It was instant. Thomas couldn't believe his eyes or his ears as he heard the sound of bones snapping and cracking back into place. It was just as Seymour had said, everyone was healed in one moment. How could they not be? They were standing in the Shekinah glory. They were literally breathing the atmosphere of heaven into their lungs. It would have been impossible to remain the way that you came. That night, Thomas had a front row seat to the miraculous. Like so many nights at the revival, it was an encounter that he would never forget. Just as it was in the days of Pentecost, so it has been in the days that followed Azusa. The fire is impossible to contain. It spreads and transforms everything in its wake. Those who wish to find it need only humble themselves and come before the Lord. There were newspaper accounts during Azusa, which I'd say the height of the revival lasted five years. The church existed beyond that. But, and like most other genuine moves of God, things happened later on that man got involved, right? Someone stole the mailing list and started their own thing. That's just some really dumb stuff. But the genuineness of what happened when people were just hungry, you know, you don't, you don't have to check your brain at the door. However, intellect is not what brings revival. All the, all the knowledge, of the Word of God is, is good because we have to discern things that we see and hear. But all of the knowledge is not going to bring revival. We had people in this situation a mixed race, which at the time was unheard of, with God orchestrating what was happening. There was a newspaper account, at least one, where people reported that there was a fire, and they called the fire company out to the building because someone saw flames on the roof of this very humble church. And it's certainly not the only occasion in history where where God has manifested himself. And we don't worship revivals, but we must worship the God of revival because while we change and we get fickle and we get bored, people get bored. You've got to get yourself in the position to receive from God so that you don't get bored. Because what happens is, is there's a genuine move of God, and mankind likes to build, build shelters like Peter, James, and John, right, on the Mount of Transfiguration. What did Peter's, Peter used to have this problem? Anybody here have the problem where you open your mouth and blah, comes out? Yeah. Yeah, we've all been there. You know, here, here they are in this Mount of Transfiguration, able to see Jesus in his glorified body, and then Moses and Elijah, and the first thing he says is, let's build a building. Sometimes that's the worst thing that can happen. 
because then we start to worship the building or we worship a memory or we look back and say that things were so much better. The only problem is our memory is selective or we fail to understand that so many times a genuine move of God is put out by religion. It's put out by order of worship. It's put out by all of these things. God hasn't changed. Our timeline, Azusa was a little over 100 years ago, but in God's time, it was now, right? How many know that there is a difference between order in worship and order of worship? The Bible speaks about order in worship. Mankind creates order of worship. And so many times, as we're going to find out today, biblical truth cuts both ways. So, for, for the crowd that is determined that they are going to be in control, they focus on order of worship. And it's not just the older liturgical churches that do that. Maybe for some people who enjoy, enjoy the fire but are not grounded in the Word, they see anything to do with order in worship as putting a wet blanket on the Spirit of God. And that's not true either. Amen. I see way too many opinions that sway completely to one way or the other. But biblical truth is biblical truth. So there's a difference between order in worship and order of worship. See, prepositions matter, right? And like last week, I said, it, it, your identity in Christ and your position in Christ is a little bit different. We, I talked about positioning ourselves so that we are able to experience and receive and be participants in a move of God. If we're going to stay on the fringes and not be willing to get our feet wet, we're not going to experience anything. And then a lot of people take that and say, well, I guess God's not doing it anymore. And he's knocking in their heart saying, well, show up where I'm at. Right? So we're going to take a little time today and probably next week, I'm sure next week at least, in looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And in doing so, we'll refer back and forth between 12, 13, and 14. Because really, we do ourselves a disservice sometimes when we put these chapter and verse delineations in there. We're better off just to consider the fact that this was a letter that Paul wrote. The chapter and verses didn't come until later. And also to understand that it was a letter that was written in response to a letter that he had received. So it's not, it's not a letter or a document where Paul just sat down and said, I think I'm just going to establish some doctrine here. Well, he did that, but it was in the form of correspondence. And if we fail to understand where we got this in the first place, we're going to miss a lot of the deeper meaning. Uh, cherry picking is dangerous, especially with the epistles. While there are doctrinal statements within the letters, whether they're written by Paul or Peter or James, there, there's doctrinal statements that some of it we can take and safely say, yes, this is a solid statement, but you don't get to pick and choose which ones you can do that with. So cherry picking leads to camps that are opposed to one another on a, on a like vicious, hateful level. I, <laughs> sometimes we joke about it, and maybe sometimes humor is a way that we, we try to take the edginess off of some of this. So the other week, I was in a, a ministerial meeting, and we're talking about Love Our Town. And Pastor Dale uh, from the Nazarene Church said, I think our, our illustrious president should preach on the 22nd. 
I said, well, I'd be happy to. But I said, let me tell you a story. He said, when I was on the road in ministry, I traveled with a guy. He used to get up all the time, and he'd say, you know, down here, we're divided up. We're, we're chopped into different segments. You're a Baptist, you're a Methodist, you're Pentecostal, you're Lutheran, and all this stuff. And he said, when we get to heaven, all those labels are going to drop off, and everyone would applaud. Yeah. And then he'd go, yeah, we're all going to be Pentecostal. <laughs> and Pastor Dale looked at me and says, I'm rethinking. I promised I wouldn't embarrass him. But we sometimes use humor, but really, we're not that awfully far apart, right? We have to extend grace to some other people, not only within our congregation, but others. There are people who will disagree with us on a lot of the things, especially that we will find in this sermon series that we're in week seven of, that they will disagree. It doesn't necessarily mean that they don't love Jesus, right? Right? However, if, if you believe what you believe, then you have to stand on what you believe. And, and having run the gamut growing up in a very non-Pentecostal, non-charismatic type of a church, but coming to understand some of these deeper things on my own, listen, I, I'm convinced. So when it comes to what happens in here, I'm going to teach the things upon which I'm convinced, but not just because I say so because of what the Word of God says. But 1 Corinthians 14, I I would say that if I had to title this message today, and maybe even part two for next week, it's behave yourselves. (laughs) Behave yourselves, okay? Now, let's not use that as an excuse to be dull to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Some people, uh, you know, they run from the Holy Spirit and they call it maturity where really we need to run toward the Holy Spirit, let the world figure out what their definition of maturity is, to be sensitive to the move of the Holy Spirit, but to be so grounded in the Word of God that we recognize the counterfeit when it comes along. We have to interpret these things properly. You know, the the term for bringing out of the Scripture what should be brought out is called exegesis. And there's a term for the opposite. It's called eisegesis. It means not Jesus, Jesus, G-E-S, yeah. Uh, It means putting in what I wanted to say. And this this whole area, this whole area of spiritual gifts and order in the church and uh, a lot of Paul's writings because they were letters to churches. And this letter in in specifically a response to a letter that he received from some people in the church. We have to be careful that we don't let our opinions, experience, or fear have us taint what this scripture says one way or the other. There are people in this world that are scared to death of a genuine move of God. And they will do anything, cloak it in all kinds of religious terms, and all kinds of, well, I'm just mature in the Lord. They will do anything to avoid a genuine move of God. Because, listen, things like Azusa, things that have happened in different places, things that are happening now in our world where people are just, just in droves coming to Jesus, it gets messy. Yeah. And you're going to have error. And you're going to have people that, that major on the excesses. And you're going to have all of that. But I would rather steward that than try to raise the dead. Because I've done that. You know, where you stand in front of a congregation and it's like a room full of six foot refrigerators. I've had people do this. Especially when you're the visiting minister. I dare you to bless me. I dare you. Just looking for just a critical spirit that will, that will look for anything. So there is some stewarding to this whole thing, but I would rather steward a move of God where people are excited about Jesus than I would to try to raise the dead. So we've got to be careful. We extend some grace to others because when we encourage people to be free, you know what? We're not always going to get it right. Does that surprise anybody? Does that surprise anybody? 
that when we're part of the family of God and we are saying we want to follow the Holy Spirit, does this surprise anybody that we're not always going to get it just right? And that's okay. That's okay. As long as we are not dropping the ball when it comes to discernment and accountability, God extends grace to us. Aren't you glad that he does? Amen. So, what I see too much of amongst churches, and keep this in mind, people who don't go to church see this too, and it's the reason most of them don't come. Sometimes you see hateful vitriol from one camp to the next. There's a a guy that called me twice. I've got his name saved in my phone. Wouldn't you like to know what I called him? Because I want to know if he calls again. He calls and he acts very sincere. My wife and I are thinking of uh, checking out some other churches. And then the longer you talk to him, he starts accusing us of heresy and, and, you know, obviously a cessationist does not believe that the gifts are still in operation. And it turns into, I just hang up. You don't argue with that. Can I set you free? Don't argue with that. Just don't. Choose not to. It, it's, it's this superiority. Right? I'm better than you. Yeah, I know better. And even though you didn't bother me personally, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that I show you who's right. It's hateful, and it has to stop. You know, in the camp of uh, sensation, or cessationists, those who believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased, and continuing, continualism, I think is what, that's what it's referred to. Those who believe that they continue, which would be our camp, that the, God hasn't changed, right? There's nothing in the Word of God that says that any of this ended. Uh, the only thing it does in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, where there are tongues, they will cease, and it goes on. There will come a day when that which is perfect has come. Well, that which is perfect has not yet come. So... Um, even within those camps. So, I've got friends on both sides of those things. And you know what? We serve the same Jesus. We serve the same Lord. And in so many of these instances, God is sovereign. We're seeing these movements happening around our nation that the lines are are suddenly being blurred. And and people of both camps are going, you know what? I think maybe I was a little too dogmatic here. And they're saying, yeah, I think you were, but I think I was too. And how do you how do you fight against the genuine move of God, right? Matter of fact, a really neat update I'd like to share with you. Andy Simbala is the leader of uh, Disciple Makers Ministry on campus. Andy has been very good about me. he communi- communi- communicates with me, sends me their newsletter. He comes to the ministerial meetings. We talk about things. He is passionate about Jesus. He is excited about Jesus and excited about people coming to know Jesus, right? So, and he comes from a Baptist background. So what? Good people, right? Good people. So I talked to him the other day, and uh, he said, have you, have you noticed some of the stuff going around on YouTube? about what happened at uh, Ohio State. I said, yeah, I just showed a video the other week. And he says, excellent. He said, the, uh, a guy that you'll see his name a lot, uh, Shane Pruitt, he's a pastor, and he's involved with the North American Missions Board, the uh, Southern Baptist. He, he calls the Gen X, or Gen Z, the revival generation. Wow. And I said, isn't it just like God? to use a generation that so many people have dismissed. And he said, exactly, exactly. So last year, he said they had their record attendance at one of their meetings. They meet on Wednesdays with students. They had 119 students, and that was like an all-time high. And they were so thrilled. The first one this year had 150. The second one had 130 last week, 130. So he's also involved at Penn State uh, campus down, down the road here in, uh, what am I trying to say, Mon Alto. Uh, 
He said last year they had one or two. Now they have six to eight. He said there's something happening on our campuses. There's something happening with this generation that they're coming and they're understanding what I have been fed is not right. And they're coming to Christ and they're coming without all the baggage. They're coming without all their religion. They're coming without all the order of worship. They're coming without. That's the key. Sometimes we got to get free from the old wineskins before we can really understand what God is doing. Man, that thrilled me to hear those good reports. So pray for that generation. Huh? Pray that God can... And, and that the kids would revive their parents. Yes. Amen. Amen. So if you're going to be hateful to another camp, know your enemy. People are not our enemy. There's one, I don't want to say person, there's one whom we're allowed to hate, and that's the enemy of our souls. Let's stop giving him more credit than he deserves. But he is a foe. And uh, we're allowed to hate him. He does not have a possibility of redemption. He cannot be born again. We are allowed to hate our foe, but let's never let it be other people. So a lot of things happen when you take a verse and yank it out of context and try to build something upon it. There was... Brother Dan, you may remember this. There was, there was a gentleman that visited us here one day, and there was a message in tongues and interpretation. And he came to me afterwards, and he said, I've never heard it before, and I appreciate it the way that happened because the Bible says that there should be interpretation or else the speaker should not speak. One of the things we'll get into, chapter 14. I said, that's true. I said, that's, of course, the public use of tongues. And he, right off the bat, well, the Bible says, that's what it says. It says, I said, well, I'm just trying to explain to him what the letter was. He wouldn't hear it because this, this was a way for him, wherever he is. I don't know anything about him. Sure, he's a nice man. But there was this part of him that seemed to accept it as long as it was under his terms. We can do that. We can do that. We can, we can approach these deeper things of God, especially the manifestation of spiritual gifts, on our terms and make excuses for our unwillingness to be a part of it. And one of the things we can do is, is claim, well, it says so right here. Well, let me tell you something. You can come up with some heresy by picking a verse and coupling it with another one. Judas went and hung himself, go thou and do likewise, right? Like that's the, the one that a lot of people use. So we can't just pull these verses out of the context in which they belong. Remember, these epistles were just that. They were letters. Uh, no cherry picking allowed. We're not going to do that. And that's why we're taking all this time to, to, to talk about this whole subject of spiritual gifts. Let me ask you, do you like it when someone takes something you said out of context? You think God likes it? I don't think he does. This is his word, and his word bears up to examination. His word proves itself, so we have to be responsible to be open to what the word of God is saying. We cannot be unfaithful to the word of God. We cannot be unfaithful to the Apostle Paul in this case, and we don't want to be unfaithful to history. Let's be accurate. Let's be accurate in all that we do. Um, Here's something else that can, can cause a problem. We can kind of approach these deeper things and say, well, okay, I'll agree, but I choose not to embrace and then make up excuses. Well, it's my understanding that, well, I think that well, I, I think that what that really means is, and that's okay to use those sayings if they're grounded in something. You don't get to make up your own truth. Just don't get to do it. 
Um, the first verse of chapter 12 is kind of where we started this whole thing. I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you to be uninformed regarding the question about the special abilities the Lord gives us. So Paul is welcoming his readers then and the readers now. The Holy Spirit so moved upon this man to write these words that I believe we can say he wants us to investigate. He wants us to learn. He's not saying, well, here's the way it is. That's just the way it's going to be. Uh, I want to talk about it. No. Part of why we worship together like this is to be informed, right? If, if, if it was just a salvation message every week and that's all we did, we'd be missing what God had designed the church to be. This is a place where we learn from one another. We learn together. We grow in our experience with Him. This is the way it's supposed to be. So, uh, let's look uh, at a couple of verses, and then that will kind of set some, some uh, parameters here. And then we'll start going through chapter 14. I really don't know how far we'll go today, but I think it warrants a, a little, some little, little extra time. Now, they didn't have orange pews and air conditioning and sound systems in mind. Uh, when they did this, but they met together. And I like that term, meeting, right? We meet together. So when we understand that Paul is speaking to some disruptions that were happening in worship, that there was some disorder in worship, and that's what he was addressing primarily. And you can find all through 1 Corinthians, you can find correction in all of this, not just what we're talking about here with the use of spiritual gifts, but primarily he's talking about within the church. And you've probably heard as well as, well as I have heard people that will rank these things that he mentions. Um, interestingly, Paul takes a moment toward the end of chapter 12 and does a little bit of a mix and match. He, he talks about some of the Romans 12 motivational gifts. He, he talks about some of the 1 Corinthians 12 manifestation gifts, and he mixes in a little bit of Ephesians 4 of the ministry gifts to the church. We like to rank and coordinate things. How, how many like outlines? Like, you, you got to have, uh, right, you know, that's the way I think too. You know, A, B, 1, 2, 3, and then all of that kind of stuff. So, that's okay, but sometimes that can really get in the way of how Holy Spirit moves and uses us. These are examples. These are examples. If we're more concerned about what God is using us in or what our title is or all of these kind of things, if we're more concerned about that than we are simply being uh, pliable in the hands of the Holy Spirit, we're going to really miss the impact of this. Th this letter is not a letter to say that these things exist. That wasn't what they needed. It was a letter saying, what's the correct operation of these gifts? And there's two in particular that Paul takes a whole chapter to talk about. One is prophecy, and the other is tongues. We can kind of understand by uh, context here that this church seemed to have a big fascination with speaking in tongues. Um, this was something that that it wasn't it wasn't that they weren't being moved by the Holy Spirit. That it wasn't genuine. That isn't the issue. The issue is that I think because of its uh, ex exciting nature, they were kind of leaning a little too heavy on uninterpreted tongues when they got together in public worship. Now, every believer, every born-again saint has the privilege of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And every born-again believer has the privilege, should they choose to walk into it, of this heavenly language. There are, there are so much, there's so much even hate sometimes 
that gets thrown around on the issue of tongues and interpretation. And, and most of what I hear is what Paul didn't want to have happen, and that is to be uninformed. So for those of us who believe in the manifestation, spiritual gifts, and we, we seek to be used in those from our camp, we can be just as confused as those in a camp that thinks that they ceased. So I want you to understand some things. I think it's very clear within Paul's writings and in the book of Acts that this is nothing that this heavenly language is speaking in tongues, this, this personal communication between us and God is something that every believer is qualified to step into. But when you're talking about public worship, there are some guidelines. And this is where the believers in Corinth were getting a little unbalanced. And give them some grace. They didn't have a New Testament. <laughs> they had letters from Paul, you know. They couldn't go back and, and read all this stuff. So, in that respect, Paul is establishing doctrine, not so much of the existence of the gifts, but how we operate in them specifically when we come together in worship. And he points out some things. He says, listen, if, if, I, if I come and all I do in a public worship setting is speak in an unknown tongue, he says, look, I don't know what I'm saying, and unless someone interprets, no one else knows what I'm saying. So there's a time and a place. I think there are times when we come together in worship where maybe uh, we get a little taste of what it might have been like in the first century church, when we just have times where I say it, let, 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 let our praises fill the room, right? right. And, and you'll, hear, you'll hear some people praise in tongues, and stuff, but we're not doing it into the microphone, so to speak. This is not that it's going to take up time from anybody else. It's a personal thing. And I don't know about you, but I am edified whenever I pray in tongues, and I find myself in the last six months just in the middle of the day, just, I mean, I can't explain it except that God is doing something. He is moving. And I find myself so grateful for that. And it's that connection. When someone asks you to pray and you don't know exactly how to pray, there's a benefit for this. And there's also a benefit for a public uh, message in tongues that we hear here from time to time, and then we wait for an interpretation. That's what Paul is talking about when we look into 1 Corinthians 14. It's an order in worship that was getting a little lopsided. And I think the one verse that expresses the balance is just this, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. We have a lot of experience in speaking and praying, not so much singing. Anybody ever have that? Sing in tongues? Yeah. Had that, I have that every so often. That's a neat experience. Talk about singing to the Lord a new song. Huh? And that, that private between me and God communication is not what is being talked about in chapter 14. If you could imagine this, kind of a, a service that is just a little bit out of control, where that's all it is, and there's no edification for each other. We, we come together as the church to learn from one another, to be encouraged from one another. Uh, prophecy whether it's uh, the ministry gift to the church, whether it's something that God seems to have put resident in you, or whether it's a spontaneous thing, which is what we're talking about here, that somebody within the church suddenly feels that God has a word and I'm going to proclaim it. It's less predictive than it is just simply uh, speaking uh, as if God is himself is speaking to us. Uh, prophecy has to line up with the Scripture or we must be careful, right? If there's no mutual encouraging, 
if there's nothing that spurs us on to deeper walk with Christ, if there's no opportunity given for people to turn their life to Jesus, if there's no opportunity to pray and have the other gift flowing, like a gift of healing or, or miracles, right, then we're not doing what we come together for. And I feel pretty confident that that's what was happening at this church. It was lopsided. So much so that Paul said, listen, I, I would rather speak just a few words and be understood than many words that are not understood. So what happens when we look at this, depending on the camps that we're talking about? One side says, well, then we just won't have any of it because I don't want to make a mistake. And the other side will say, oh, that's, you're just cramping my style. We're just going to do whatever we want. That's not right either. Can we embrace it all? Can we embrace a, a, a mindset that says, I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to miss what God has for me. I don't want to make up my own rules of operation that exceed what is already written for us in Scripture. Let me read the first uh, handful of verses from 1 Corinthians 14. I'm using the New Living translation today. Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you won't be talking only, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be all mysterious. He's not saying that you're not speaking to God. He's just saying that this is the limitation of it. Verse 3, but one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Verse 5 says, I wish you all I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. So, prophecy. It, an understanding, a moving of the Spirit, on the part of the speaker, that God wants to interject a heavenly message for the benefit of all. If the message is not for the benefit of all, gathered in a service like this, well then, it would be out of order. Prophecy is not getting up and telling everybody about yourself. Uh, prophecy is not a prepared message, although there have been many times in a message where I will all of a sudden have this understanding like, wow, I never even thought of that. Bang. And it's like this is exactly what I'm trying to say, right? So there are times where, when that, that infusion of clarity, and you know it came from God. How do you know it comes from God? How many were here last week? Figure it out. Figure it out. Spend time in His Word. Spend time with Him. We figure it out. He said, I, I wish you could all speak in tongues. Well, I just got done saying that every believer can step into this if they choose to. We maintain, and I still believe, that it is an initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But listen, God doesn't grab a hold of you and rip your mouth open and make you say things. It's cooperation. It's cooperation. 
I think, I think this is something that people have shied away from perhaps because it's so confusing or maybe it's at odds in our church world. But I think we should all do it more. I think there are people here or people watching by live stream that have said, well, if God wants me to have it, then I'll, then I'll take it. We're not talking about in a public worship setting. I know ministers who have been following Jesus for years who have a fantastic public prayer life, freaking in tongues, praying in tongues, who have never once given a message in a church meeting, and it doesn't mean anything less of them. I seldom do it. And, and it's not, we're not ranking spirituality here. But every born-again, spirit-filled child of God has the privilege if they just simply choose to walk into it and not make it so difficult. Don't beat yourself up over it. Don't listen to other people. Just do it. It's just like when we come to Jesus, right? It's all by faith. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we, the, the idea is you drop all of that stuff. You drop all of the striving, and you, you drop all of the working your way in, and you say, I have nothing to bring except my wicked soul, right? <laughs> and I just come, and I give it all to Jesus. It's the same way when we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the, the ability to communicate your spirit to God's spirit, because that's what it is, and just simply step into it. I want to encourage you to just demystify all of this. Approach it with the same faith that you approach the faith you needed to receive Jesus, and just do it. God, I want all you have for me. I, I, I I am setting myself apart from the world. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. I need that power for witnessing, and then just simply walk into it. But Paul is talking about within the confines of a public worship setting, someone who cries out with a message in tongues. That is what we should wait and expect that there would be interpretation for. Uh, He goes on, and we'll cover this a little bit more next week, but he goes on to say uh, some of the order in worship that should be followed when this happens. If we have all kinds of people just giving all kinds of messages and tongues, and, and it seems like there comes a point where it's, it's taking up too much time. Uh, sometimes the spirit of the person can get a little too headstrong. Sometimes it's about the speaker. And I think we can easily segue into that no matter how spiritual we are. So Paul suggests two or three, two or three, and then move on. See, it's not order of worship, it's order in worship. He's saying, behave yourselves, but don't use that as an excuse to be spiritually lethargic. He's saying, embrace all of these things, but understand when you're gathered together, that it ceases to be about the body of Christ when, when you grandstand. And if you've been around Pentecostal churches long enough, you've seen people grandstand. Should not keep you from choosing or desiring to be used in spiritual gifts. There was a lady one time in the church Oh, and it always helps, you know, when you use King James English. Thus saith the Lord. If you think last year was, last winter was bad, wait till this year. I don't know. I'm a little, I discern that to not necessarily be of God. Maybe I'm wrong. One lady, I'm not picking on the ladies. One lady one time said, uh, as, as Noah led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And instead of just understanding that, hey, listen, we're cooperating. Our mind gets mixed up. She said, thus saith the Lord, I hath made a mistake. <laughs> Doesn't have to be King James English. 
How do you know if somebody has the interpretation? You don't. But here's something we got to keep in mind. If we're worshiping with other people who do not believe that this is still something that we can pursue, be quiet. Be quiet. You don't have to prove anything. I believe that's the best way we can interpret when Paul says, if no one is there to interpret, let the speaker keep silent or pray to himself. You don't have anything to prove. There are also times that I don't hear this talked about too much, that there may be there's somebody in the congregation that God is speaking to, to give a word, to uh, interpret what is being said. The onus is on them too, right? So we extend some grace. So what do we do? If there's a message in tongues, we wait sometimes the speaker, that's the first thing, uh, the Bible says the speaker himself or herself should prove, you know, take a moment, not prove, but take a moment to discern. Maybe God, pray that God would give them the interpretation. If not, we wait. And uh, on the rare occasion that there's no one that feels they have it, we move on. And we say, well, we'll just sit that on our mental shelf and let God prove it one way or the other. There, there are just some things we cannot suppose to know the heart of a man or a woman. Yes. We cannot presume to know what's going on at all times, so we give some grace. I would like everyone here to feel comfortable that if you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to share a, a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or prophecy, or you feel so strongly that you have faith to believe for somebody's physical healing, that you find a time to just cooperate with God, which is why we allow time. We allow downtime. We allow times where nothing is happening for that very reason, because we don't want to structure the Holy Spirit out. We want to be patient with one another, understanding with one another. But listen, folks, whatever you do, don't do this. Don't do this. We need to have order in our worship and that everything we do is glorifying to God. But Lord, help us if we are so afraid of a genuine move of God that we program him right out in favor of our order of worship. So, what's the biblical advice today? Behave yourselves. Do the right things when we come together in a meeting. If you're going to speak, let it be constructive. If you're going to pray, let it be something that everyone is beneficial, uh, benefited by. Keep love as your highest aim and highest goal. And be willing to step out. Step out a little bit further. Step in a little bit deeper. Amen. We're going to take a couple or three weeks to talk about these two things, prophecy and tongues, interpretation, because... It seems to be something that there's all kinds of little tales about, and a lot of people don't take the time to examine what the Scripture has to say. But what I want to do today is give you an opportunity. Now listen, you don't need anybody, if you're born again, you don't need anybody to pray for you in any of these things. You have the authority to come before heaven's throne in Jesus' name. However, we need one another. And we're going to have a little bit of time here. I want to carve out some time so that you have freedom. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come. We're going to respectfully say goodbye to our streaming audience and thank you for being with us today. But uh, some things don't translate on the screen. Some people don't like the idea of cameras being on them. Let's just take some time. Can we do that and pursue these things? Let God settle some of these things in our minds. So, God bless you, uh, streaming audience, as, as we say goodbye to you right now.